I'm not sure this is a story I'm ready to tell yet, but I thought I would um, make an attempt at it right now. The reason that I'm not sure about it is even though the story uh, was mostly made to completion in, I think it was July 1st, uh, 2016, uh, it's still something that uh, that hurts me to, to even talk about. My close family and people on my Facebook page will know the story. They might not know all the details, but they will have followed this uh, with me over the course of the year or 18 months that it took to actually happen. My dad died in uh, February of 2015. And obviously that set off a whole bunch of uh, things that <laughs> that are required when that when that happens to somebody, uh, including you know what to do with the house and all of his possessions and, and everything else. Um, obviously, a very trying time, and you know it was me that found him dead, which is a whole other. I didn't enjoy the day, but at the same time, I felt as though that was kind of a natural progression, is for your son to find you. Uh, there was all kinds of other details in there that I that I won't get into right now. Maybe I'll make a video about that sometime, but, you know, pretty personal. It's been difficult since that time, um, you know, uh, recognizing his death and him not being around. And I really, there's all kinds of car things I'm doing that he would be interested in, which I can't tell him about. And, and that's kind of my, um, that's the worst effect of losing your dad is that uh, when you shared something like Cars in Common, and you continue on with it, uh, you know. I can't, I can't, I can't celebrate my successes with him. He, he would, have, he would have enjoyed that. He would have enjoyed the videos I'm making today. I'm making a lot more videos today than I did when he was alive. So uh, yeah, he would have been, you know, he certainly would have been one of my most supportive subscribers. One of the things that I had to deal with was what to do with his two cars, three cars, four cars. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, I'm already fucking it up. Five cars. So he had five cars at the time of his death. He had an early '90s Hyundai. I think it was an Elantra. Total piece of shit. It was already dead. All kinds of shit was breaking down, and the, the wipers didn't work anymore. Usually the heater didn't work. The the belt would not stop squealing. It was a total fucking piece of garbage. So he knew that that thing was at the end of its life, and that's what made him buy. A, I hope I don't get this wrong. Uh, I, I'll correct it on screen if I do. A 1985 Firebird. I think it's a 305. Might be a 350, but I think it's a 305. And I'll tell you right now that I, I sold that for basically what Dad paid for it uh, only a couple of months prior to my uncle Pete. And uh, Pete wanted he wanted that car. He wanted a. I think he wanted a little bit of, uh, you know, the history of his uh, really his brother-in-law. So I was more than happy to do that because it was not a car that I needed or wanted or whatever. And I knew that I was going to be faced with what the hell to do with the other cars. So that was a good scenario. It, it, it provided me with some money that I could do other things with. And uh, I said, no problem. It was a really bitching car. I have, uh, I think, two videos of it. Uh, at least one that I know of where I drive through downtown Trenton, Ontario in the car. And when I'm doing that, I'm doing that the night before I found Dad dead on the floor. So that's the Firebird. I think it's 86. Anyway, still in beautiful shape. Peter's looking after it wonderfully, and uh, I thank him for that. Okay, now we might as well go to the uh, 1946 Crosley, which Dad was trying to make into a uh, ridiculously powerful wheelie monster. Like an actual wheelie car. I don't know if he was going to have ballast in the back or whatever, but... Uh, him and Wayne built a really bitchin' uh, square steel frame. It was beautiful. Front end was, was operational, and I uh, can't remember, maybe a Ford 9-inch in the back, or, you know, uh, I think it had to be. And they, and they had to <laughs> they had to shorten the wheelbase, or the, um, this car is not very wide. Like, if, if go go on Google, and look at Google Images for a 1946 Crosley. It's, it's a really weird car. It has a face only a mother could love. But they were often used as really freaky, um, gasser, strange dragsters of the 60s and 70s and, and whatever. 
So they're, you know, they're pretty common, uh, common for that usage. You know, just because they look so fucking weird, uh, they, even though they're American, they look kind of oddly French or English or some shit. Like they look kind of fucked up European. So anyway, we had this 1946 Crosley body that they put on a custom frame. And I think it currently has a Windsor 351 engine uh, on it, which which I think really Dad only put there to kind of size the engine up and, and make sure that the body would fit. And there's no way this thing was going to be a normal fucking driving car, it, or not registerable at all. He would have been sitting in the back seat for sure because the engine just sticks right into the freaking into the cockpit, and it would be a backseat driver for sure. I mean, they might as well put the goddamn steering wheel right in the middle of the car. That's how weird this fucking thing is. And, you know, maybe water tanks on the back for ballast or something. But he wanted a wheelie car, right? You know, and I'm, I'm not going to try and talk him out of that shit. Why would I try and talk my dad out of making a, a high horsepower, crazy ass thing that will just like spin wheels at the drop? Or if you can actually get traction, you'd have to have race slicks. And he did buy some race slicks. I think I gave him a wing. But anyway... That's not something you're going to talk your dad out of if you're any kind of normal person. He bought some crazy boat engine that I think... I don't know whether it was supposed to go into this thing or it was supposed to go into the 53 Studebaker or what the hell. But there was lots of trading going on and that engine's gone now. But Anyway, that was the Crosley. That didn't get uh, finished. He was actually already not well... Uh, at the time that him and Wayne were working on the frame and all that kind of thing. So I, I, that thing was not going to get, that probably wasn't going to get uh, completed, even if he had lived another three or four years, right? Okay, so that's the, <laughs> that's the Hyundai, the Elantra, or whatever the fuck it was, the Firebird, and the Crosley. To be honest, if I, if I was a millionaire, I, I probably would have brought the Crosley home as well, but there was enough to worry about. So then it came down to two cars, 1951 Mercury and the 1953 Studebaker. Both of those are bucket list cars for my dad. His first car was a 1951 Mercury, essentially. So that was always a bucket list car. I should mention, though, the 51 Mercury was at one point owned in the early 80s by Polygram Records, or 79, 80, 81, as a promotional car for the release of soundtrack LP for uh, Grease, the movie Grease. And they had it painted differently than it is now, but they did have the rear rear fender covers uh, painted as Grease, and, and he had that repainted on top of the new paint job. Um, they traced it out and, and had a pattern for it, so uh, not the original paint, but it still looks pretty cool. So that's kind of the claim to fame of that thing. He bought it in Toronto in about, I don't know, mid-2000, let's say, at, at earliest, 2005. So anyway, that was the car he wanted. But uh, eventually his breathing and his, his lung capacity wasn't good enough to work the, you know, the all-manual system. You know, and even I find that to be, a, you know, a thing. And I'm, you know, I'm 24 years younger than him. So I understand that. But rather than convert the Merc to power steering and power brakes or whatever, he, uh, he eventually bought his second bucket list car, which is 1953 Studebaker. He always loved the style of it, and I don't blame him. It's beautiful. One of the, one of the most beautiful cars made in America. There's, there's little doubt about that in my mind. So anyway, he bought that car as a, one of his bucket list cars. I think he bought that in... I should know, because I have a video where I'm running it, and he's in Michigan... Um, uh, visiting his beloved. Um, I'll have to look it up. 2010 or 2011. I'll, 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 I'll put the correction on the video because I, I'm bound to fuck shit up here. Because I remember coming out and the, the second day that I was there for that thing, he wasn't going to be there for the drag race, but I was going to drive this motherfucker. Never have driven it before. And at this point, the hood was off. It had a huge tunnel ram. Two massive four-barrel carbs. And and a, a a scoop with a bug catcher on the front, and I mean this thing just like it just it looked gnarly, you know. I'll put some uh, links up in the video and down in the description for the uh, my first starts of that. I, I've got some videos up, and that's what will tell us what the what the date of that was. 
but anyway, I come out in the morning and, um, you know, I got up early enough and, you know, I thought, oh, well, I'll get a little bit of a, a handle on how this car works. Check the oil and stuff to make sure I would make it the 50 miles or whatever it is to the drag strip. Like I say, this is the first time I'm seeing the car, except for pictures that Dad sent me an email. He did tell me, don't get worried about smoke and shit coming out. Maybe even clogging up the windshield without a hood on. That was, you know, that was just part of it. You get a little blow by or you... That's what happens. People don't drive around much without their fucking hoods on. So I knew that that was going to be a thing. I think I just went there hoping that I could get there and back <laughs> without uh, fucking it up. Because he'd had a bunch of... Well, the engine had been replaced not too long prior. So there was all kinds of things that we just didn't fucking know about it. Yeah, so that's the that's a bit of the Studebaker story. I probably went down a path there I shouldn't have because I was trying to you know, get everything in. The two cars that I knew that I was going to try to bring to British Columbia uh, were the Merc and the Studebaker. Uh, they were the only viable ones to care about. They were his bucket list cars. Um, I had come to know and love them. You know, I talked about the early days of the Studebaker, but uh, eventually Dad refused to race it because by that point, I actually had a lot more time behind the wheel in any driving condition than he did. <laughs> well, as we started to get into the whole racing thing and the engine got replaced already, so like he just kind of went full hog and, and, you know, that's what ended up with the twin quads and the, you know, tunnel ram and, and uh, we eventually put a new cam into it. There's a video for that as well. So it ended up becoming this kind of like freak show Uh you know, not much of a dragster, really, but, you know, something that really had a cool, you know, cool presence to it. Like, when you show up in a car show with that, especially when the when the, the hood was off and you got the thing all hanging out. And, you know, the can would just rumble. It barely idles. You know, it, it it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool car to show up to a car show. In. And, I mean, it has some power. I, you know, I think I only did five or so runs in it. I think my best one was 91 miles an hour. 14 and a half or something. That's also a video that's up. So it's not catching the world on fire, but at the same time, the first time we took it when I was with him to the, uh, to the drag strip and I'd been, I'd been to the drag strip the previous year without him. 2014, we won the best drag car trophy, you know, obviously not as the fastest car or the, you know, any of that kind of shit, but just like people really look, dug the look of it. It's a classic style and it looked the part, you know, it looked badass. When I went through tech inspection that year, they said, where's your helmet? And uh, I'd already checked the rules and I'd already been a couple of times and knew what the rules were. Convertible, had no top, or they had a uh, roll bar system. You know, you don't want to be knocked out just by your head hitting the roll bar right next to your head. Uh, or a car that is like obviously, you know, on nitro or, or you know, a sub 10 second car kind of thing. So those were what I understood as the rules. And when he said, you know, where's your, you know, where's your helmet? The the funny part of that is, you know, I told him it looks crazy, but this car ain't fast. <laughs> so he kind of believed me. And uh, now just to fuck with that a little bit, I have to admit, I did abuse the fast lane, the lane that is reserved for nitro, nitrous, uh, or, uh, really fast cars, or they have a parachute. And so I do apologize for that to the arm drop people because I, it, you know, in the early days I abused that pretty badly. A lot of those cars in there, they don't have alternators. They don't have water pumps. They don't, you know, they can't be sitting around just idling. You know, they turn those cars off and they get pushed up to the line because they, you know, they only have a run uh, before you have to either charge the battery or, or whatever. And like I say, they don't have cooling systems half the time. They just, they're, they're meant to go. And that's it, you know. They're meant to drive eight seconds at a time. So now we get into the complication. 2015. So in May, I started to ask around about uh, car shipping companies who could potentially take these two cars from Ontario to British Columbia. About, I don't know, 2,500 miles-ish. And... I did have some recommendations from various people, but of course, uh, car carrying people, they need to fill the space because if they're going to bother to drive across Canada, just like they would in the States, probably they need to 
it's best if the spaces are all filled because otherwise you're just the cost can be shared a little bit and the driver can make the trip knowing that they're getting the maximum amount of uh, you know space out of it. So some of the ones that I was recommended certainly weren't prepared to do it in any time soon and they couldn't actually name a date. Uh, I didn't actually need a specific date, but I needed some kind of idea when they might be picked up. We brought both of the cars. Uh, at that time, I was able to drive them both over to Wayne's. Shit broke on both of them when I was actually driving them there and some of those issues are not fixed now because I haven't needed lights or uh, I don't take either of the cars out when it's raining. So uh, the windshield wipers are broke on both and the lights are broke on both, which is kind of fucked up, but that's the way shit goes. Um, I think I'd actually come back to British Columbia by this point and I found a company and I'm going to name them because they need to be shamed. Uh, the company was called, they don't exist anymore for the reasons I'm going to get into. Uh, vehicles in motion. Uh, I've learned a lot about vehicle shippers uh, in this process and uh, the terrible stories that I'm about to tell you are something that you should keep in mind. You, you might even want to contact me if you ever want to ship a car any appreciable distance uh, because I have some idea about what to stay away from. Anyway, vehicle in motion or vehicles in motion or whatever the fuck they were are a broker. So really, they don't have any trucks of their own. They're just somebody who arranges uh, individual shippers and coordinates them and schedules them and all that kind of shit. They sounded reputable. I looked them up online and there was, you know, enough conversation about them that it was a le it seemed like a legitimate thing. They, they were registered in the U.S. I can't remember what state it is now. I've got some of that info down. But they did have a, I think it was a Calgary phone number for the Canadian arm, if you will. I'm not sure that Canadian arm ever actually existed as a sub part of this uh, company that's that's up in the air right now, but that's who I phoned. They'd originally, I think, assigned me some dude named Aaron. And here's where things get complicated, and you'll start to hear, you're gonna hear it more in um, chronological order than I did. I didn't know this at the time. I said, okay, Aaron, you know, they, they gave me his email. And that's who you ship the, or that's who you send the money to. So I wired him some money um, through the bank. But then about a day or two later, they go, okay, no, Aaron can't do it. He's stuck on some other job, and we're going to have to assign it to this other fucking dude. And he says that the contract has been transferred to a guy named Brian. I won't give you his last name here, but if, if you have this problem with this company or whatever, I'll, I'll happily email it to you. Like I say, you know, some searches I did originally didn't show any problems with this company, but about about the time they picked up my cars, now that I look back on it, like now that I search it now, all of the shippers that we're talking about here ended up in some kind of financial problem or they got they definitely got way in over their head and they had too much shit moving around. They didn't have enough trucks to move it. So shit was just building up in some field in Edmonton. I'm ahead of myself here, but I'll, I'll try and edit it in such a way that it fucking makes sense. I have a video, I think it was August of, August or September of 2016. The cars kind of finally got picked up by this Brian guy. And I got video of it, uh, you know, I got pictures of the license plate and the fucking trailer. The trailer was brutal, man. Like... It was a long trailer. It, it held the two cars, but the booger wells on this fucking thing, they were done by a, a, a blind apprentice. I mean, it, it, I didn't like that, but they assured me, everyone assured me, that this was not going to be the trailer that was transporting the cars anywhere. They were just going to Aurelia or Barrie, Ontario, to get stored until they got onto the proper trailer. Uh, I don't know why I, I wanted to believe that, essentially, I think is the problem. This kid was a wheeler dealer. I actually drove him over to Walmart because he forgot some of the fucking packing materials he needed. It was a clusterfuck for sure. And uh, I should have just said, you guys can fucking drive away and tried to get my money back from them. But like all things, it had been so long since I'd originally contacted them. It had been, fuck, I don't know, six months of just failed attempts to get them to pick the goddamn cars up after I'd paid them. 
that I was just, well, I was positive that something was happening. So I think that really is what clouded my, uh, well, it's clouded my better judgment. Because I did spend some time with this dude. Like I say, I drove him over to Walmart so he could buy some, you know, packing material that he just fucking failed to, you know, he knew he was, you know, he knew he was going to need it. But they're just fuck-ups, man. And criminals, really. So anyway, yeah, end of August or something like that, end of August or September, uh, they picked up the cars. I drove them on the truck myself. Showed them how to operate the Studebaker because it had a weird, you know, the, the whole ratchet shifter thing was not a normal one. It was kind of fucked. And uh, we'd also done a bunch of work to the Merc, uh, which I've kind of gone into in some of my videos where it's got the two batteries, one that just operates the starter solenoid and and the six volt that operates the, the engine. Um, so there was a bit of funkiness there. You know, both those batteries had to be up or the car is not going to fucking start. And that started basically a year-long process of, of trying to find these fucking cars after they got picked up. I was told that um, they were both going to go to a corral place in Edmonton, which is kind of where they had, you know, kind of whatever, more than halfway, but kind of halfway point where they corralled everything and then stuff fanned out from there. Um, even if they had to go back to Saskatchewan a little bit or... or West, further west to uh, to British Columbia or somewhere in Alberta. And then I had a problem ever getting a hold of either of these dudes. Like I, I tried to phone vehicles in motion and get shit out of them. Couldn't find this Brian guy, although we had had like a long text conversations about uh, the when and where's and, and, you know, me being very, well, forgiving on uh, a whole bunch of pickup uh, things that didn't happen and just follows in the schedule and our trucks are broken down and the trailer's fucked and so anyway I was being about as accommodating as I could possibly be because I just want to get these cars I think the original price was 5500 bucks or something like that to ship the two cars which is a high price already but were it done correctly and were it done in any kind of normal time frame uh, I'm cool with that after a while communication broke completely down where I couldn't raise this guy at all. He just would not respond. No phone calls, no text. And obviously now I'm seriously worried and I'm trying to figure out how to have them uh, arrested for theft or whatever. The problem is that I obviously, you know, whatever, sent back a contract and paid for them to do work for me. So really it's more breach of contract than it is uh, auto theft. Um, so that complicates shit. Uh, I did phone around to some of the police departments, both in Ontario and in BC, just to see what the hell is going on. I think I even phoned the Cal or the um, Edmonton police to see whether uh, I could do anything about it. And basically, they said you need more evidence that the car is actually not coming to you, and that it's not just a delayed delivery or whatever. So nobody was able to do much. And they and also they all mentioned that uh, you have a contract with them, so really you you kind of need to sue them for breach of contract rather than actual theft. Uh, I mean, I have video of, uh, up on YouTube by that point already with, of me driving the car. So the, I, I basically, I gave up my cars to them and they, they haven't stolen them out of my property. So I understood and I knew that was going to be the thing. I just wanted some, I wanted some guidance. Did talk to a couple of lawyers. They had similar things to say. They basically said, if you don't get them back or they refuse to deliver them or they tell you they're not going to deliver them, they said, you know, call us back and we, we might be able to do something. But I'm frustrated as fuck, and uh, it's been basically a year at that point. Not quite, but almost. Where I, I wasn't hearing anything. And at one point I traveled back to Ontario just for my normal yearly visit. And I was just out driving around. I think I was out at the Air Force Museum and a couple other places. It was just one of, my, one of the days where I go and, you know, hang around my hometown kind of thing. And I was driving along, and I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. I get calls from all kinds of, you know, places for business or whatever. And it was someone saying, um, you know, hi there, this is, um, I don't remember the name of the place right now, but, I, but I, I'm forever honored to them that they did this. They said, um, you know, Mr. Bennett, are you missing a car? And uh, I said, well, actually I'm missing two cars. So uh, why don't you tell me what's going on? Because this sounds very ominous to me. And this is what I told them on the phone. I pulled over at this point because I knew that uh, I needed to know what the hell this is about. And I didn't want to be driving and talking. 
So they said, well, what, you know, what cars are you missing? And I said, 1951 Mercury and a 1953 Studebaker. And, and she said, well, I'll stop right there. The Studebaker is the one that we have. And some guy named Brian dropped this car off um, something like eight months prior or six months prior, meaning that the car actually did make its way to Saskatchewan not long after it got picked up. But it got abandoned at this service station. What I later found out happened, or what she had actually told me at that point, was that he had dropped this car off of the truck, told them to do some work to it, and that he was a friend of mine, and I would appreciate the fact that they're fixing it while he does this other delivery back to Ontario. So he made it as far as Saskatchewan with the Studebaker on, then got a new deal, which he could probably make a lot more money at because he probably already blown through all the money that I'd given them the year before of a Hummer that was that was sold to some dude in Ontario from Saskatchewan. So he dropped the Studebaker, put the Hummer on the truck, and then drove the Hummer back, got paid for that as well, and then never came back to pick up the Studebaker. And in fact, by that point, it had $1,200 of storage charge and the failed repair bullshit reasons that he had left the car at. And um, so he couldn't afford to get this car back if he wanted to. So he just left it there. And that's when he stopped talking to me because he didn't want to tell me that he had fucking abandoned the Studebaker at a place in Saskatchewan, which it was never supposed to be at anyway. I can see it going through Saskatchewan, but yeah, it was never meant to stay there. So they were very kind to me. I told them under no circumstances at all are you to release this car to anybody without hearing from me first, of course, because I, I needed to hang on to whatever the fuck I had at this point. And that was only the Studebaker. I still didn't know exactly where the Merc was. But I said, yeah, hang on to it. I said, I'll, I'll pay the fees or whatever. Um, but they knew that I wasn't in on this or any kind of bullshit like that. I told them, you know, it was subterfuge of him to uh, leave it there under those guises because I didn't tell him to have anybody fix it. I said, I was just trying to get the car home. I said, I'll fix that shit myself. So they took much pity on me and they did reduce the, uh, the storage charge by a, by a, a, quite a bit, a, more than half, I think. And, uh, you know, I did pay the repair bill and all that. And, uh, you know, I, I would have understood if they had a, had no choice but to charge me the whole amount because it wasn't their fault, you know, that shit's fucked up, uh, you know, it was this uh, shipping situation. Anyway, I might put it on the screen because uh, I, anybody who is in Saskatchewan, I, I urge you to use these people because they're, they're wonderful. So once I knew where the Studebaker was, I, you know, I immediately drove back to Wayne's and, and, you know, I had major news, even though they were watching TV, I came in and said, I know where the Studebaker is and every, you know, everybody rejoiced. I put it up on Facebook and everybody, you know, friends, family, and all my Facebook friends were happy as fuck that I knew something, because prior to that, I knew shit. And uh, the news wasn't good, but I knew where it was, and that's that's about as good as it was going to get at that point. Immediately after getting back to Wayne's place, I texted Brian, the chipper guy, I, I know that you abandoned the Studebaker in fucking Saskatchewan. What you need to tell me right now, and under no uncertain terms, is where the hell is the Merc? Faster than he had ever replied to me before, he actually sent me an address in Edmonton uh, of the place where where they do corral cars there. He wasn't lying about that initially, but he told me what the address is and the phone number of the dude who I could contact to go and get the car. And, and after doing that, I immediately started to look for people, uh, obviously reputable people, and, and that's difficult to find. I, I will tell you, a lot of these places, they look fucking reputable on paper, but really they're just subcontractors, by some greedy motherfucker who, who just wants your money and they don't give a flying fuck if they uh, finish the deal or not. So anyway, I found some companies that had excellent reputations and, you know, sussed them out. They were not cheap because it cost me as much as it did originally to ship the cars from Ontario to British Columbia to go and get one in Saskatchewan and then drive up to Edmonton and get the other one and bring it to the island. Now, there is an extra $1,000 premium to get them to the island because that's what the ferry charges for trucks over 20 feet or something like that. But by that point, I just said, look, give me a reputable company, take a big truck, go get both cars. And I arranged all that. 
I had one towing company go and get the uh, Merc out of the field because I knew that that flatbed that I had hired was not going to be able to drag that thing out of the field. So go get a hook truck, go get the Merc, uh, drive it over to my, um, my cousin's place in, in Edmonton. Pete's son, actually, the, the Peter, the guy who bought the uh, dad's barber. And equally thankful to all of those people for helping me out on that kind of thing. So yeah, I hired the tow company and just said, look, go get this thing. Here's the number. I've already talked to the chick. And, uh, you know, of course the people who own this property, they don't know really the shit that's going on with the whole shipping company. If they do, then they're complicit and they should fucking die as well. But I don't think they know the extent of how many people are fucked. Anyway, the tow truck driver phones me and he goes, say, what kind of car am I looking for? Even though I've given him all the details, the VIN number, the license plate, the, the grass was so high that he couldn't find a fucking 51 Mercury in the field. And he said there was like, whatever, like 60 cars in the, in the field that he was looking at. I can't remember the exact number he said, but he said, it's a shit ton of cars over here. Fuck, I should have rescued a few more and just like found the owners and, and helped them out. But I, I don't have that money or time. So he did find it. It wasn't in that bad shape. A little bit more rust on the chrome and stuff that it had, but I fixed most of that. So no serious damage. So that was the thing. In one day, with one call from Saskatchewan, I was able to find both cars. And within a couple of weeks, uh, I at least had them corralled to a place where I felt comfortable. And then the, the other trucking company showed up, picked them up, and it was a wonderful transaction. But I paid another $5,500. To have another company go and get them from there, so now we're talking like a lot, like a th eleven thousand dollars to ship two of Dad's cars from Ontario to here. I'm a little bit regretting that now because I'll never get that back, even if I sell these cars. Dad probably would have said, "What the hell's the matter with you? Like, <laughs> why are you even contemplating that?" And you know, at this point, I'm glad that they're here. I love them, and and. Uh, you know, once I had started the process, I had to finish it. So there was no, I was not leaving them out in the wild. Uh, they had to get here. So I finished the job and, and, you know, it was all for my sake and for dad's sake and for the car's sake. But, you know, now that I'm a few years past that, three years, I do question myself. You know, now I've, I've got some concerns and I just think, well, that was like 11,000 bucks, you know, for nothing. Uh, they're not registered in BC, so that's a whole extra expense. Even if I sell them as is, you just sell them as unregistered cars. You know, you can knock five or six thousand dollars off the fucking price of a car on that thing. You know, even though they were registered in Ontario, that doesn't mean shit in another province, right? I don't know. I'm glad. I'm glad I did it. Uh, but if I were to do it again and and with sober, you know, second thought or or three years sober thought, yeah, you know, I would say I would have had an easier time selling them in Ontario as registered cars, in better shape than they are now, blah, 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 and, and minus the 11000 for the shipping. And uh, so it, it's a bit of a dilemma. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get rid of them. Uh, I mean, now I would sell the Studebaker before I sold the Merc. The Merc is in better shape. The Merc's an actual running, driving car. Studebaker is a bit of a nightmare. Um, you know, it's no longer really a street car. You can go to A&W with it for car day on Sunday or whatever, but, the, you know, or drag race it, but there's no, there's no word to drag, drag race around here. So it's, it's a bit of a basket case. I mean, it's not what it is. If it was a stock Studebaker, I'd get more money out of it. It'd be a different deal, but you know, somebody's going to want some kind of crazy custom fucking thing that was dad's vision, you know? So anyway, either the first of July or the end of July, I can't remember right now of 2016 that the cars arrived. And it was quite a day. I had a bunch of uh, cousins and uh, helpers over to help me get the cars off the truck and down the driveway and parked and whatever the fuck. Neither of them ran at the time. No, sorry. We got the Studebaker running and I backed it down, but uh, we had to tow the... Yeah, the Merc wouldn't run. We towed it. I finally did get the... Uh, with a battery jump or a new battery, I managed to back the uh, Studebaker down. But of course it stalled a million times, hadn't run in... 18 months or whatever, you know. And like I say, with the cam and all that shit, it's it's not an easy runner anyway. You've seen me trying to start it, and, you know, I caught it on fire last time I fucking tried to start it. But um, trying to ship those two cars back, uh, you know, took a few years off my life. Um, I was worried I would never see them again. I was worried I spent all that money and would never see the cars even with that. 
And then I had to fork out for double the fucking shipping charge. And, you know, now I'm worried about the financial burden on just like trying to maintain these things and, and keep them in any kind of shape. Uh, you know, a lot of this I was buying out of the inheritance money because, you know, they were, you know, trying to update, uphold the legacy of dad's, you know, cars and stuff. Um, you know, probably maybe that's not, maybe that wasn't the way to, to do that. I don't know. I'm not going to sell either of them unless I have to. You know, I'm still getting enjoyment out of them, so I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure, you know, Dad was a pretty practical guy. I'm pretty sure he would say just, you know, he he wanted to sell the Merc anyway and just, you know, I don't know. I, I think if I were to tell him about it, he'd say, fuck it, man. Like, if you need the money, then, you know, ditch both the cars, you know. It's just a car. And, uh, you know, that is indeed what it is. I mean, they have a little bit more emotional baggage attached to them uh, being his, but... Uh, you know, I have to be practical about it as well. And I, I'd really rather not get rid of either of them. But like I say, I would start with the Stude, unfortunately. And, and sorry, Stude 53, I, uh, this pains you probably, but I won't do it until I have to. And I'm going to get, uh, you know, spring's coming. I'll get a bit of fun out of them before I do anything. So we'll see. You can expect some more videos of me, um, well, working on them and doing my shit. So anyway, I think I'll leave it here. I've, I, like I say, I don't think I've touched on all the things I wanted to, but essentially be careful if you're ever going to ship a car. Avoid the brokerage thing. If someone says that uh, they're going to hire some dude to ship it on their behalf or whatever, I would just leave them behind. Find a company that's been around a long time and is reputable. And in particular, find a company that just mostly does cars. It'll cost you more initially, but if, if what they do is cars and that's where they made their reputation then they're much better off than a company that will ship whatever, or, you know, like, yeah, we can ship anything. And, you know, all those promises are total bullshit. It's, it's a, it's a total scam. This is a difficult story, but it's been fun. I'd like to uh, do these sorts of things on YouTube and uh, I'm glad that you all uh, stick around. So thanks for watching and uh, talk soon.